upon 1.1, um, particularly um, 1.11 of Stein's Elementary Number Theory book. And uh, again, these videos are intended to be a supplement to the textbook. They should not be like a replacement for reading the textbook. So my expectation is that you read the text, the whole section, and then go back and watch the video to see if um, you, know, you picked up the same things from it that I might talk about here. Also in these videos, I'm not gonna talk about necessarily every single part of the book that I'm gonna scroll through. I'll just try to give you some of the highlights of this section too. I'm gonna try to keep these videos short. So in particular, my daughter's having a good time in the other room. So we're talking about the primes, not a new concept, but just so we're all on the same page, we'll talk about the natural numbers as being the set of numbers, whole numbers one, two, three, and onward. And we'll say that the integers are all your positive and negative whole numbers, and then that includes zero as well. Definition 1.1 should look pretty similar if you're coming out of like an intro to proofs type of class. So what's it mean to say that two integers divide each other? So we'll say that two integers a and b, we'll say a divides b, and the way that we'll write it is with this kind of solid dash in the middle, vertical dash. And so a divides b, if you could write ac equals b for some c that's another integer. And then it's also common to write uh, a does not divide b, in which case there's no such integer c, so that can make that happen. So like to give you an example here, probably pretty easy, but to say something like um, two divide six, since y, since uh, in this case, two times three, that's my c, is equal to six. So I could find some number to multiply two by in order to get six. Hope that makes sense. So we just want to be comfortable writing that down. And so coming back to this equation here, when you think about what it means for a to divide b. Okay. Just so we're all on the same page too, you've probably heard of prime and composite numbers before. We're gonna call an integer prime if its only positive divisors are the number itself, n, and one. And otherwise we'll call an integer composite. So just so we're all on the same page again too, the primes, the first few, the first prime we'll consider is two. So two is the smallest prime, and then the next one is three and onwards. The point is all those things don't factor anymore is probably how you might say that. In particular also notice two is the only even prime, right? If there was another even prime, it'd be divisible by two, therefore not prime if you think about it. Uh, and then the first few composites would be four, six, etc. So in other words, all of these things can be factored a little bit more. There are some other um, ideas about what prime should be. So in this book, uh, we're going to say that 1 and negative 1, we're going to consider neither one of those to be prime numbers. So just like this list up here starts at 2, again, 2, consider that as the smallest prime number. Now, what I'll also do is I'll jump to Sage. Sage has some cool built-in stuff for number theory. Um, in fact, uh, William Stein, who wrote this book, is also the founder of CoCalc, and so has done a lot with Sage. So what I wanted to do is just to make sure we're comfortable with, you know, typing something like that into Sage. So if you'll bear with me a moment, I will try to put that up over here too, so you could see. So I should just be able to type something like prime range uh, 10 to 50, and then you could either push the button run with your mouse say, or if you hold shift and push enter, it should run the code too, and ta-da, it spits it out. So I just wanted to verify to you that yes, the code in the book gives you an output, and it should work. <laughs> Uh, what else? In the next one, just to see, when you start these brackets here, you're telling Sage that you're gonna make a list. So we're saying, I'm gonna list all the integers n, and then describe these n. So n is gonna go for n in range. So where do you want them to go? Say 10 to 30. And what do you describe these n? What condition do you want it to satisfy? So that's what this if does. And so if not, there's this built-in function pr is prime. So if not is prime. And so what this function is prime does is it checks, does your integer n that you plugged in, is it prime or not? So what we're telling this to do is to make a list of all the composites between 10 and 30. Remember though, you don't include that right endpoint uh, in Sage with the range function. So it really only counts up to 29. So when I push uh, shift enter, it should spit these out. And again, that matches the list that it spits out in the book as well. So just to make sure that Sage is working the way that it's supposed to, and hopefully you think yeah, it's kind of easy to do. Cool. So really the fundamental results of this section is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And this is something that you know we take for granted. A lot of, a lot of you are teachers and um, you know, teach this kind of stuff to your students all the time too. So every natural number can be written as a product of primes uniquely up to order. So to give you an example, something like six is equal to two times three, 
And what this uniquely up to order means is we're gonna consider that the same thing as three times two. So we'll consider these as the same thing. That's what it means by uniquely up to order. So any number, any composite should have a prime factorization. Now, what is interesting is maybe it's like, well, why is that a big deal? Well, it's something that we take for granted about the structure of the integers themselves. If you happen to have had a modern algebra class, uh, you know that the integers form a ring. And so more or less what that means is you could add and subtract and you're still, you still get an integer. Uh, and you can multiply and you still get an integer, but I'm not gonna guarantee we could divide. So that's more or less what a ring is. And so in the integers, this isn't a very uh, surprising fact, I suppose. I guess as far as teachers are concerned, because we kind of take this for granted, I feel like. Like, of course, 6 should factor as 2 times 3. And in particular, there's not another way to factor 6 if I'm just using the integers. But uh, what if you had a different set? So let's look at this set here. What does this say? This is all expressions of the form a plus b times negative, square root of negative 5. So something like 1 plus square root of negative 5 is an element of this set. I mean, something like 3 is an element of this set, too, if you took b to be 0. So all the integers are in there as well. So in particular, right, this is just some subset of the complex numbers. Right? You could simplify that as all expressions that look like 1 plus i root 5, if you wanted to call it that. Same exact thing. My point, though, is, is what is that? what if that is kind of your, your number system, if you're thinking about it that way? Well, if that's your number system, then let's take a look at 6. 6 is equal to 2 times 3, but 6 can also be factored in this completely separate way. And so, uh, in particular, the uniqueness property here is not satisfied. And so that's actually a pretty strong property of the integers that is not necessarily something to expect of maybe all possible number systems. And so here is an example where, again, unique factorization fails. But for the integers, mostly where we will live, uh, we can take for granted that, yes, any integer every natural number, I should say, should factor uniquely as a product of primes.